So I'm James Martins, a researcher at Mapevine, and I'll be talking today about uh, optimization for machine learning, and more specifically neural networks. Um, so the topics I'll cover um, are gradient descent, which is essentially the standard canonical method, momentum methods, which are simple ways of accelerating gradient descent, second order methods, which are sort of slightly more complicated ways of accelerating gradient descent, and then finally I'll, I'll talk talk about stochastic optimization and how it sort of relates to these ideas. Um, so motivation, well, numerical optimization methods are sort of the methods that enable all modern machine learning techniques to, uh, to work, essentially, to adapt their parameters to the uh, problem at hand. Um, in particular, this is the engine behind deep learning. Um, so the idea is that you solve a uh, you basically phrase your problem as a minimization of some objective function that quantifies the performance of the model. Uh, so for example, that could be prediction error, mistakes in some task. Uh, and the general idea is that they work by making small incremental changes to the parameters over time to decrease the uh, objective function towards what is usually a local minimum. Um, and this strategy works in some sense because the objectives are well chosen, they're smooth, they're nicely behaved in various ways. Hopefully the local minima are actually good. All right, so just briefly some notation that's going to carry through the lecture. Um, I'm going to denote by theta the parameters of the model. That's that. These are the quantities that we're optimizing, um, or that we're adapting. The objective function will be denoted by h, and our goal is is always going to be minimization of h uh, with respect to theta. Uh, so. Gradient descent, which is sort of the standard method, is uh, quite simple. You just update your parameters um, by taking a negative uh, step in the direction of the gradient. Here the gradient is defined this way um, as a vector of partial derivatives. Um, alpha is called the step size. It's also called the learning rate, depending on which uh, literature you're reading. Uh, and this controls sort of how aggressively you move in that direction. Um, so why should this work? Well, gradient descent, um, so the gradient direction, um, which is what we're using to change the parameter, is essentially um, the direction of greatest reduction in the objective function per unit of change in theta. This is, what, this is why it's also called um, steepest descent, uh, because it is sort of the steepest direction to, to, to follow. And you could phrase this formally as, you know, the gradient properly normalized is just given by this limit. It's like the it's the vector that is, you know, whose norm is less than epsilon um, that minimizes the objective function. Um, and, I, and as this becomes true, this, this equality as epsilon goes to zero. Um, so if h is relatively smooth, then the gradient will keep pointing downhill over some sort of non-negligible non distance. Uh, and this is sort of the key fact that, we, that makes gradient descent work. Because of course, if you you know if you followed it and in, right immediately suddenly your your objective function curves or changes or experiences some kind of discontinuity, uh, then this whole strategy would be hopeless. Um, you could also motivate gradient descent as um, optimizing a certain local approximation of the objective function. So if you think of the objective function as being approximated by its own first order Taylor series around the current theta with respect to some perturbation d, then um, you know, this, is well, you can, this is a sort of the canonical Taylor series uh, first order approximation for, for h um, around that theta. Uh, it's just the current value plus the gradient times the, uh, the, the d vector. Um, and so if you have a condition called Lip Lipschitz smoothness, which I'll sort of define later on the gradients, that, that this essentially uh, means this is saying that you know, this approximation won't be too bad if d is small enough. Um, and the gradient update is computed again by minimizing this local uh, approximation now in some kind of <coughs> sphere of radius r. So we're not, we're obviously, you know, if you minimize this thing globally, this local approximation, you'll get, well, essentially it'll actually just make the parameters infinitely large in whatever direction is, whatever direction the gradient is pointing, which obviously won't be any good. The reason that's no good is because you know, the approximation is wrong if you go too far away. So we restrict ourselves to this sort of sphere of radius r. And this implies that our, the update to our, um, 
uh, our, our parameters should be some scaled version of the gradient, which is what gradient descent does. Um, so gradient descent is you know, a, a reasonable f uh, first algorithm, but you know, it's, it's got some obvious problems. And, and the example which I'm going to sort of carry through this lecture uh, is, the sort of, is the sort of running example that I like a lot, is this sort of simple two-dimensional quadratic. You could think of this almost as a, if, if you don't want to you know, think of a, the objective function itself as being quadratic, this is sort of what the function looks like locally in some area. Um, and you might imagine sort of this sort of curved valley. So you have um, the, the sides of the valley are sort of curving up sharply in this direction, but it's fairly flat in this direction. And what gradient descent is going to do, depending on the learning rate, is it's either going to sort of bounce back and forth between these directions of high curvature. Uh, it keeps going to keep hitting sort of the sides of the valley and then getting sh uh, shoved the other direction very fast. And this, if your learning rate isn't um, small enough, is going to result in these oscillations that get bigger and bigger and eventually you diverge. Um, you could also take a smaller step size to alleviate that problem. But then, and, and, you, know, you do get this stable behavior. But now your progress along this very flat direction is now limited by how big your step is. And if your step is very small, you're going to be making these tiny, tiny, tiny incremental changes. It's going to take a very long time to go in this flat direction. Um, so the problem here is that you have very curved directions, very flat directions. That's sort of the bad case. That, and if, if you think about condition numbers, this means that the condition number is big. Uh, so no good choice there. Um, right, so this is exactly basically what the, the example is, uh, is demonstrating. If you have uh, functions whose curvature varies in different directions, um, gradient descent is quite slow. Uh, and there's, um, there's sort of no sweet spot in terms of the step size. You either, it's either big enough that you get big oscillations, or it's small enough that you're sort of too slow in the flat directions. Um, so, um, and, and perhaps, you know, to further, uh, another way, I think, of discussing gradient descent, uh, which will lead into, you know, possible solutions to this issue, is that um, we are essentially minimizing not a first order approximation to the objective function, but a, a second order approximation to the objective function. So this is the similar Taylor series from before, you know, up to first order, but I'm adding it in this quadratic term now, uh, which is a function of the Hessian. And um, what gradient descent could be thought of doing is saying, well, I don't have access to the Hessian, so I'll, I'll approximate that with some scalar times the identity matrix. And now my quadratic looks like this. Uh, and if I minimize this quadratic, I get, once again, a scaled version of the gradient. Um, if L, for example, is some upper bound on the curvature, um, then you can, you can sort of show this is a reasonable thing to do. That this, in fact, this step size, 1 over L, is sort of the optimal step size in the worst case. Um, but you know, so, the, so the issue here, what this illustrates is that you know, Li is actually quite a, quite a poor approximation of H. It sort of, it, it's the most pessimistic approximation possible. It says you know, all of the um, curvature in all directions is equal to the maximum curvature, which is, which is the safe thing to do. But it's, all, it's also you know, it's going to slow you down a lot. It's going to result in very small step sizes. Um, prevents, prevents divergence, but slow convergence. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll touch on a little bit of theory here. Um, so you could formalize these statements. Um, so if we talk about H as having Lipschitz continuous derivatives, which is this property here, which is essentially saying that the gradients don't change too much when you change your position, um, when you change theta. Uh, you know, in particular, that it's bounded by L times the change in, in, in theta. Uh, and L is actually the same L from the previous slide. Um, and if you have another condition, strong convexity, and this is usually just um, a conven convenience condition if you want to prove a global convergence. If you care about local convergence, you might not have to have exactly this kind of statement. But you might want your function to at least be locally strongly convex, sort of strongly convex in an area. Um, so the, with these two technical conditions, and also just that the gradients are computed exactly. So again, I'm not, we're not getting into stochastic optimization yet. Um, you have um, this kind of bound for convergence. Um, so you see that the objective function value um, versus the value at the optimum, which is theta star, 
um, can be upper bounded uh, by this expression here, which is um, fairly, you know, somewhat intuitive. So you, this is sort of the initial distance from your starting position, which is theta zero, to the optimum, uh, and then you have um, essentially this this ratio to uh, the power two k, and um, k here is the, your iteration number. So you're, so this is this is um, Depending on the, the nomenclature you use, this is called linear convergence, or ex, you know, you could also think of this as sort of a convergence at a kind of an exponential rate given by this rate. Um, and uh, here, kappa is this condition number, which is the ratio of the largest curvature divided by the smallest one. Um, this this mu term from the, the previous slide, this is sort of you could think of this as capturing the, uh, the smallest curvature in the objective. It's a lower bound on it. Um, so this is, this is sort of, you know, this is an upper bound, so you, you, you always have to take with a grain of salt. It's, it's not like a, it's not a, it's not a lower bound. It's, it's not an equivalence. Um, you know, these things could converge faster than this rate. Um, but in the worst case, they converge at this rate, and it gets worse and worse as the ratio of the largest curvature to the smallest curvature gets bigger. Um, and, and, you know, and, and so that, that's not great because in neural nets, for example, you could imagine this effective condition number being very big. Yeah? When you say highest curvature and lowest curvature, mm -hmm. is that close to theta or is that anywhere? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. So like, if you're proving these kinds of theorems, you almost always just take these constants to be globally true across the whole function. But in practice, of course, if you know, the function is doing some weird stuff out there that you don't care about and you sort of restrict yourself to a neighborhood, you could just talk about the behavior in that neighborhood and then just sort of apply this theory, assuming that you stay inside of that neighborhood. And some of the theory is sort of phrased that way. They say, like, assuming we don't allow ourselves to deviate from some small, small ball epsilon and that, the, that these conditions hold inside of that ball, then we get convergence such and such. Um, yeah. And in some sense, one of the advantages of you know, other methods is that they can kind of adapt to the local properties. Um, if, L, if the effect of L and mu are changing, you, know, you might actually want to sort of change your learning rate um, as you go. Uh, and in some sense, that's what second order methods do, but we'll get into that. Uh, right, so you, you can look at the, as the, the number of iterations to achieve convergence to a, a tolerance epsilon um, is, is given by this expression. Um, so, so, so convergence theory is, is, you know, is, is interesting, it's informative, but it, it, it's, it should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, so this is an upper bound, and so it has to work, and in particular, it has to work on all the objective functions that sort of satisfy these smoothness uh, properties and, and, this, and this local um, strong convexity property. Uh, and this includes, in particular, worst case examples. Um, now, real problems are not really worst case, and they often contain sort of special structure that actually might make them much easier than the worst case. Um, so you can think of these bounds as actually quite pessimistic and unrealistic, and the learning rates that they tell you to use are actually almost always overly conservative. Um, so uh, for example, you could imagine there, there being other technical conditions that might help us out. For example, if you have clustered eigenvalues in the Hessian um, conjugate gradient, as, as a method, turns out to be much faster than gradient descent. Um, and uh, it also might be the case that you know, the, the direction of smallest curvature might be completely flat, so, so flat that it's actually unimportant to optimize it. And you'll, you can get sort of a reasonably high, a reasonably good tolerance with just ignoring that direction. So sometimes the, uh, the effective condition number is now different. Um, but it's hard, to, it's hard to exactly be rigorous about that. Um, another problem with these kinds of bounds is that they're basically describing asymptotic performance. Um, how do you do as you, after you've waited a sufficient amount of time? Um, and in practice, we actually stop optimization long before these sort of asymptotics matter, um, either because we're interested in preventing overfitting or because we've simply run out of time. And um, there's this sort of phenomenon that actually, you know, what goes on in the early stages of optimization is actually not really well described by the theory that describes what goes on in the late stage. So you might hope that, oh, if you have better asymptotic performance, you have be better pre-asymptotic performance. Um, but those th two things don't necessarily correlate, um, at least not very strongly. Um, 
There's also no guarantee for the, in, in these bounds for non-convex objectives. But this is mostly due to the fact that you know, we don't know how much better or worse local minima are, or sorry, how much worse they are versus global minima. Um, this is kind of an ongoing research question for various non-convex objectives. Sometimes you know, and sometimes you can prove things, but oftentimes you don't, especially for neural nets you don't. Um, so I would say that you know, at the end of the day, what people do is they, is they see how things work in practice. You know, theory is a guide, but it should not never be a, 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 an absolute prescription for what to do. Um, so one uh, way that we can improve gradient descent, probably the simplest way, is with a method called momentum. Um, and the, mo the motivation here is that um, the, you, know, you have the, this, this direction of descent which changes potentially at each iteration, especially if you're sort of go bouncing back and forth al along one of these valleys. Um, and you sort of want to see that and kind of damp it down um, and hopefully cancel this kind of oscillation naturally. Uh, so the solution is to um, essentially build up a overall velocity as you go. So you sort of add your previous directions together. You allow oscillating directions to cancel themselves. And directions that are sort of persistently moving in one direction, they get amplified over time. Um, just as you would have a, uh, a ball sort of rolling across a smooth surface, it will sort of start to accelerate in directions of persistent motion. And, but if, it's, if there's some kind of oscillation like this, it sort of never really builds up much velocity in that direction. Um, so it's, and it's quite a simple um, modification, really, of the classical uh, gradient descent method. Um, so here, what we're going to do is we're going to maintain a velocity vector, v. Uh, and it's just equal to some kind of de a decayed version of the previous velocity vector. So we don't, we don't allow the velocity to accumulate, to accumulate infinitely. We sort of uh, pretend that there's some kind of friction in the system that slows it down over time. That's accomplished by multiplying it by this constant here, which is you know, typically a constant like 0 0.9, something that decays it gradually, but not, not, uh, not too fast. And, um, and, then, and then we just add in the current gradient, scaled by the learning rate, and now we add this velocity to the current parameter. That becomes our update now. Um, and there's a alternate version of uh, momentum called Nesterov's method. Uh, and this um, is actually quite similar if you, if you know how to write it. Uh, this way, it's essentially just the same update as momentum, but there's this sort of look ahead step where you sort of compute the new gradient not at your current position, but sort of at, at a position that you sort of anticipate that you'll move in. Because in some sense, right at the very next up, you know, at the next update to the parameters, we're sort of moving ahead by precisely this, although plus this gradient term, although we don't know what the gradient term is yet, so we can't compensate for that. But we can sort of do this partial compensation for our anticipated next update. Um, and it's, this version is, well, it's, it, it behaves similarly in practice, although it has some better theory. Sometimes it works better in practice. Um, so here's this failure case from before for gradient descent. Here, um, and what momentum allows us to do is we, sort of, we, you know, we start oscillating, um, as you would with gradient descent. But then um, immediately, once you want to sort of move back, Momentum has already remembered the direction going this way. So if it sees another direction going this way, those will cancel um, arithmetically. And you won't actually have any sort of net velocity sloshing back and forth anymore. And the only velocity that you'll sort of persist over time will be this consistent direction pointing downwards. So you sort of get faster and faster in this direction, and you dampen the oscillations in this direction, which is precisely what you want. Um, so, right, so Nesterov method, I mentioned this, it has stronger theoretical guarantees. It's, it's slightly better in practice, although oftentimes it doesn't matter. Um, the differences are bigger when the learning rate is larger, and you can actually show that it becomes equivalent to the standard version as uh, the learning rate goes to zero. Um, so I'll, now I'll talk about some convergence theory for uh, these methods, uh, momentum methods. Um, so first I want to make a definition. So a first order method. Is, uh, is technically defined as one where the update that you take at each iteration is given by a linear combination of the gradients computed at previous iterations. So this is the, the technical statement here. 
it's like the, this is this up this is the difference between the two consecutive parameter vectors, which is just our update, and that's uh, that's inside of the span of the previous gradients evaluated at these previous iterates. Um, so this definition um, includes as, as as special cases gradient descent with and without momentum. It also includes uh, more complex methods like conjugate gradients. Um, although it doesn't include any method that would multiply the gradients by some non-trivial um, matrix. So like say a, a second order method. Um, and so um, to analyze this general class, uh, we, we, we can construct a um, sort of a hard case as, a, as an objective function which um, while it is quadratic, and that's a nice structure to have, is nonetheless um, hard enough that it'll sort of stress these methods to the maximum. And this is the, this is the example. It's an infinite dimensional quadratic. Um, so we're going to assume infinite dimensionality here, um, given by this expression. And I won't, I won't try to unpack it too much. Um, it's basically just a, a technical con uh, construction. And you can show uh, that um, any first order method so this includes gradient descent, momentum, all, you know, CG, um, actually has this lower bound. So this is not an upper bound anymore. This is a lower bound. This is, this is how well it can do in the best case as applies to this problem, um, where, where you've picked the learning rate optimally and such. Uh, and it's, it's actually you know, somewhat reminiscent of the bound we saw before. Um, although it's actually, it's actually better. It's, 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 it's better than the, than the upper bound, because instead of having uh, kappa, which is the condition number, we now have the square root of kappa. So, we, so it's, actually, it's actually better than that, um, than the upper bound. Um, but um, you could say, OK, so actually how much better is momentum? Um, and of course, it can't be better than this lower bound. Does it actually match the lower bound? Well, it turns out that it does. Um, so if you, if you have the standard conditions about Lipschitz smoothness and um, the, uh, the local strong convexity, um, then if you choose the parameters well of momentum, so which is the decay and, and also the, uh, the learning rate, you have this upper bound, which essentially matches the lower bound from the previous slide. So you can say in some sense that mo momentum, or in particular this, this bound applies to the, to the Nesterov uh, version of it, um, is optimal in the worst case. Um, and we can see that sort of summarized here. Uh, so this is, the, this is the worst case, lower bound for first order methods. This is what gradient descent gets as an upper bound. And this is uh, what, what, what um, Nestor's momentum does. Uh, so this matches the lower bound. Um, but I should say that these are, again, worst case constructions. So you might want to conclude from this that, oh, well, OK. I mean, if, if we're doing first order methods, that's it. That's the end of the game. Nestor's momentum is the only thing you should use. Um, that's not true. Um, it's not true because this, again, there could exist examples that have a special structure uh, that, that this weird example that we constructed doesn't share that would actually make some hypothetical method better than Nestor's method. And indeed, I mean, you don't, this doesn't even have to be an intellectual exercise. There is an example of this, which is a conjugate gradient. If you apply conjugate gradient to a finite dimensional quadratic, it'll actually technically converge into a finite number of steps. Um, and if you want to, if you, if you could even experience faster convergence if you have, say, for example, uh, clustered eigenvalues. So if, you're, if, you're, um, if, you're, if you have a quadratic problem and the eigenvalues of its Hessian are clustered in, say, three spots, you sort of roughly converge in three iterations, uh, which you wouldn't get with Nestor's method. Um, nonetheless, you know, worst case, case analyses are you know, important, and you could maybe argue that some hard problems like neural nets might sort of be approaching the worst case, although not exactly. There is a gap there. Um, uh, anyway, and then this leads into the next type of method, uh, which, is a, which are second order methods. So we, we, we remember from before, you know, we could, we could talk about uh, gradient descent as minimizing a uh, quadratic objective function, um, where we sort of took uh, which is a rather a local approximation to our true objective function, and uh, we um, we took the Hessian, which was you know this complicated object, and we we approximated it with uh, L times I, where L was the sort of upper bound on the uh, the curvature, 
which could, you could also think of as the largest eigenvalue of H, um, at least if H was sort of the largest eigenvalue of all possible H's as you sort of move over the surface. Um, and, but we could actually just minimize this form without doing that kind of approximation. So just, just, just leave H as it is. And if you do that, you get this kind of update to the parameters, which is the, uh, the inverse of the Hessian times the gradient. And this would imply a, a basic iterative method that looks like this. This is essentially Newton's method now. Um, so what does that do? Um, so this is, again, our familiar behavior of gradient descent. This is with momentum. And, and, and second order methods, in some sense, if they're behaving well, they immediately model this sort of, they see this curvature here, they see this flat curvature here, and they just zoom right to the optimal spot uh, immediately. If this was, a, if this was actually a, a quadratic, it would actually converge in one step. Um, but it, insofar as it's not exactly a quadratic, it'll sort of, it'll take more iterations than that. Um, so that sounds great, but there's a lot of problems with second order methods. Um, the, uh, the first problem, which is probably the most important problem, is that this idea of approximating the function you know, locally around the current point, of course, you know, relies, relies on us not moving too far. If, if, we, if, you know, we, if, we, if we base our update on this, on this minimization of this local approximation and the approximation breaks down beyond a certain radius, uh, then we sort of have to restrict ourselves from moving outside of that radius, um, which can be difficult and it can slow us down. Um, and um, also, once, unlike you know, this, this approximation that we were doing before, which was like the, the largest eigenvalue times the identity function as an approximation, uh, or the identity matrix, rather, as, a, as approximation of H, um, you know, if, we, if we use a, the real H um, and, and we start moving away from our current position, actually, um, the effect of H, like as there's H as a function of your current position, will start to change, and these small directions of curvature that we've sort of measured might actually be, become wildly inaccurate very fast, um, because it's no longer an upper bound. It's no longer a global upper bound anymore. Um, in fact, the curvature could even become negative, which would then, if you try to then sort of literally apply this sort of minimization of a local quadratic for, with a negative curvature, that essentially just means you you, you, you zoom infinitely far in that direction of ne negative curvature, which doesn't make any sense, obviously, um, <clears throat> because our, our, our function is not actually quadratic. So again, we're, we're going to follow this prescription of staying within some local region around an update of size 0. So you know, we're, mini we're, we're uh, minimizing with respect to d this local, um, local approximation, but keeping inside of this some local region r. Um, so I'm just going to check how I'm doing in terms of, I have no concept of how many slides I've actually done. Uh, and this doesn't say, unfortunately. Okay, I'm about halfway through, a bit over halfway through. I might, I might slow down a little bit then. We could also have a, <laughs> we could also have a break. Um, <laughs> Ask me if you want, want me to go slower, and I, I can do that. Um, so, so yeah. So a solution to this this problem is is to take um, our region to be this um, essentially a sphere um, centered at zero with radius r, and um, it turns out that doing performing this minimization is uh, you know, can be accomplished uh, with, with this formula here, which is essentially just saying we add a multiple of the identity to H before we invert it, and then we multiply that by that gradient as usual um, for some multiple, which is given by this lambda. So it turns out that the relationship between lambda and the radius R is sort of a complicated function. And Fortunately, though, you know, if, 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 if this is all you want to do, you can just work directly with lambda. You don't actually have to think about R and, and model that relationship. You can just say, OK, um, 
I know that each lambda is equivalent to some r, uh, provided lambda is big enough. There are certain technical conditions here I'm sort of glossing over. Um, so we just sort of think about adding multiples of the, ident uh, the identity to, um, to h as a sort of a general technique. And there are ways of adapting the exact value of this multiple, these sort of heuristics that are um, somewhat theoretically supported, such as the levenberg marcard method. Um, another solution um, is, uh, is to use, say, a different type of matrix than the Hessian. Um, one that might have more forgiving properties. So um, this L times I, you know, which is, which, was a, which is one alternative to the Hessian, is a poor choice because it's sort of saying that all directions have this same curvature and it's actually the worst case because it's the largest curvature over the whole objective. Um, but you could imagine choices that are sort of more subtle than that but are still not as aggressive as the Hessian. So they might say, well, I'm going to throw maybe all neg directions of negative curvature. I might sort of hedge my bets and think of the curvatures as you know, high, um, because that's, sort of, that's a safe thing to do. right? If, if curvature, because curvature does change as you move in the objective. If you're always conservative, that means you're sort of more likely um, to not overstep in any one direction. Uh, but you don't want to be too conservative. It's this sort of balancing act. And, and designing these matrices is kind of a whole research topic. Um, so um, and, and I, found, I found in my own research that, in fact, you know, a combination of, of this kind of idea of substituting the Hessian for a kind of a, a matrix with nicer properties, and then still applying the, um, these traditional trust region techniques um, is actually sort of this yields by far the best performance in practice on neural nets. Um, so, yeah. Um, this might be a silly question, but obviously solving a matrix like that is MQ. Can you uh -huh. do that in your matrix? Yeah, so, so that, that'll be touched on um, in the next few slides. Um, this is, yeah, this is the other big problem. So right now I'm still tackling like the first big problem with second order methods. But yeah, you're right, exactly. The, 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 the problem of this giant matrix is the other big problem, and it sort of has to be solved in conjunction. Um, right. Uh, so, so some examples of, of such alternative matrices are the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix, uh, the Fisher information matrix, and the empirical Fisher information matrix. These are sort of the three matrices that are used pretty much in, in neural net research. Um, so, actually, what, how, what time is it, by the way? Uh, hmm. OK. Maybe, maybe I'll just discuss the generalized Gauss-Newton, and then we can take a break. Um, so the generalized Gauss-Newton uh, is a matrix that you can only apply uh, when you have certain special structure. So in particular, um, we're going to assume that our objective function h uh, is the sum of um, smaller objective functions, hi over i. You can think of i as indexing the cases in a, in a training set. So this is, this is a very standard situation in machine learning. Um, in particular, each hi is given by a loss function, which measures the difference between a target and the prediction made by some f function, which you know, will often be a neural network parameterized by theta, which takes x as its input. Um, right. And, um, so if you have this kind of structure, uh, and that you have that, in fact, the loss function is um, also convex in, the per, in its parameter z, uh, where z is the prediction, um, then you can define this generalized Gauss-Newton matrix. And it's given by this formula here, uh, which is somewhat complicated. So I'll, I'll try to unpack this. Um, so you have essentially the. Um, the Jacobian of the f function uh, transposed times the Hessian of the loss, and then the Jacobian again of the f function. That's the definition. It's um, it's so you can. It seems somewhat arbitrary, um, but I think I think one thing to notice immediately is that the um, if h, so if the loss function is convex then h is actually a, a 
positive definite matrix or a positive semi-definite semi matrix, and depending if it's the convexity is strict or not. And um, that means that this whole thing is provably positive semi-definite, which is a good property. That means that there's no directions of negative curvature, which is one of the things that was sort of worrying about the Hessian. Um, so you can, so there's different interpretations, different motivations for this uh, kind of matrix. Um, you can think of it, first of all, as um, what the Hessian of H would look like if we replaced each F with a, um, a local linear approximation of, of F. Um, so we're essentially just plugging in F's first order Taylor series. Um, into the definition of the objective function and then computing the Hessian. And so that's just this. Um, and so you can show that, in fact, you get this, you get this form. And the Jacobian appears here. This is, this is why the Jacobian appears in the formula for the generalized Gauss-Newton. Um, if the loss function is a squared um, error, which is a, you know, a very standard classical error, it's probably like the, like the classical um, loss function. Um, then you get that the Hessian is actually equal to the identity, and the generalized Gauss-Newton G actually just becomes the sum of the Jacobian times the Jacobian, which is the classical Gauss-Newton. This is why it's named after Gauss, is because this is actually a very old idea. Um, and he was you know, experimenting with these kinds of squared loss functions all the way back then. And um, so you, you see this matrix appear in the so-called Gauss-Newton method for optimizing nonlinearly non squares problems. Um, you could also show that if the loss function is equal to the negative log prob um, of the target in the, in, the, in, the, in the training set given the prediction z, which it very often is uh, for some natural conditional density p, and this, again, this happens all the time in, in machine learning and neural nets, uh, then the generalized Gauss-Newton becomes equivalent to the so-called Fisher information matrix associated with this conditional um, probability distribution. Uh, and in fact, in that case, G inverse times H, which is this update that we're going to we're going to compute from, from this scheme would be just called the natural gradient. Uh, so there's a whole literature on the natural gradient and its various properties. Whoa, that's not good. Hopefully it's just my computer taking a siesta. Uh, come on. Yeah, you think changing the slide wouldn't would prevent it from going to, to sleep, but whatever. All right, um, and the GGN matrix has some nice properties. I, that I, well, I already pointed out that it's positive semi-definite. That means that there's no directions of negative curvature. Um, it seems to be more conservative than the Hessian in the sense um, that it sort of often tends to overestimate the curvature in any one direction. Um, which is good. It's good to hedge sort of in that direction. But it, you can't prove that it will always overestimate. In some cases, it will underestimate. Um, and the, uh, you can show that if you do take updates with the inverse of the generalized Gauss-Newton times, the, times the, uh, the gradient, as, we, as one would, that in fact your, um, your optimizer becomes, in some sense, invariant to how you parameterize your objective function, which is a very nice property to have. Um, unfortunately, though, that invariance is sort of um, asterisked by the condition that you need to uh, take very, very small updates. So this is only technically true if you're taking sort of updates that are sort of infinitesimally small, which is sort of more of a theoretical curiosity. You'd never actually do that in practice. But it's nice to know that at least as your updates get smaller and smaller, it starts to behave more and more like this perfectly uh, parameterization invariant method. Um, just to just to be uh, just just out of curiosity, how meaningful is that to people here? If I say parameterization invariance, who? I just wanted to ask, what what kind of parameterization are we talking about? So this is the parameterization of say the the uh, the neural net itself. So you know you can. If, if you want to take the example of neural nets, you could say, like, I, you know, my weights are, you know, my typical parameters, and usually I'm optimizing those. But you could pass the weights through some kind of um, invertible function. And then 
plug those into the neural net. And you could optimize, you know, assuming that, that, you've, that there's this sort of additional invertible function between your parameters and the neural net that are sort of changing the, the definitions of the parameters in some sense. And methods like this, um, you know, if you're taking very, very small steps, you can show that it'll behave exactly the same no matter what that invertible function is. So, so which is nice because we're sort of, we don't quite know that our, 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 the standard way that we've parameterized neural nets is the optimal way, right? It might not be, right? There might be a, you know, from, a, from the standpoint of optimization, um, a different parameterization can make a world of difference. Um, so being invariant to that choice seems like a good thing. I wouldn't say that it's obviously a good thing, but um, it, it's, because you know, there are, this was actually brought up by uh, somebody in my, my uh, PhD exam, um, but you know, there are trivial examples of systems that are invariant to the parameters that are, the parameterization that are nonetheless stupid. Like uh, say for example, you, your optimizer takes no steps at all, right? It, its update is always just um, the zero vector. That is technically invariant, isn't it? But it's a very poor optimizer. Um, nonetheless, it seems like a good thing to have. Um, and uh, this is analogous, so there is an analogous property for the Hessian um, that you might have you know, read about in sort of standard optimization textbooks, and that's that their optimization with the Hessian, so, so classical Newton's method, in other words, is invariant to linear reparameterizations of the function. So if this invertible function that you've inserted between your parameters in your network is actually just a multiplication by a matrix, uh, say, then Newton's method is invariant to that kind of thing. But this is actually a stronger form of invariance. And it's kind of curious that we've approximated the Hessian with this other matrix that's sort of a, maybe you could even think of as a poor man's Hessian, although I wouldn't. Um, but it's actually now, it, its invariance properties get better, not worse. Um, and you can actually show that the Hessian is not invariant in this sense. It's, it's, it's actually, like, it's not just that it, it's only, it, it's not just that we, we don't know, it's that we, act, we know that it isn't invariant in, in that sense. Um, so in practice, if you, if you take updates um, that you've computed with the generalized gauss newton matrix like in this way, um, you, you know, I've been able to show that uh, this is sort of hundreds or even thousands of times faster than gradient updates. Uh, so that's great. Uh, of course, you know, I haven't touched on a very important issue, which is that we don't know in general how to compute these um, updates efficiently in high dimensions. Uh, and that's sort of, this is now getting to your question. Um, and I think I will take a break there and we can discuss this problem and, and solutions to it um, after the break. So we'll resume. Um, just the uh, projector heats up here. Um, right, so we, so we left off uh, talking about uh, second order methods and sort of this, the first major problem, which was that they're, they're using this local quadratic approximation that becomes um, inaccurate if you move out too far. And we had different solutions for that, different matrices that we could use instead of the Hessian or different techniques to constrict the update that we ultimately compute by minimizing that local quadratic to restrict it into some kind of region where the, the uh, local quadratic approximation remains accurate. Um, but that doesn't address the other, the second major problem with second order methods, which is that, you know, we're dealing typically in very high dimensions. Um, for neural nets, the, the parameters can, you know, have potentially tens of millions of dimensions. And neural nets are getting bigger, um, you know, every year. Um, and these Hessians, or these, uh, these replacements for the Hessian, they all involve these giant n by n matrices. Um, and then to actually invert that matrix in order to compute the optimal update um, requires n cubed um, uh, floating point operations, which is, is going to be way, way too much if we have tens of millions of dimensions. Um, so. Um, and this problem existed even well before, you know, neural nets got very big, even in the 90s, you know, you had neural nets with like 10,000 parameters. Well, that was too much um, even back then. Um, even 1,000 parameters might have been too much for like a, a 486. So 
Uh, people have been trying to solve this problem for a long time. And even before that, into the 60s and 70s, this is sort of the topic of the classical optimization literature. How do we do Newton's method cheaply? Um, so there are, um, you know, we have three. Whoa, that is getting irritating. See, the issue is that these Google laptops have very, very strict security settings. So if you step away from them in a coffee shop, they lock you out very, very fast, because otherwise somebody will spy on Google. Um, so you have, to keep, you have to keep moving. You have to keep active. Um, so right. So we, want to, um, so we want to approximate the curvature matrix um, such that we can you know, compute it efficiently, that we can store it efficiently, and finally, that we can invert it efficiently. Um, or maybe we'll resort to proximate inversion. That's another possibility. So the first major curvature matrix approximation are, is diagonal approximations. And, and typically, this amounts to taking the curvature matrix B that you would normally have, whether that be the Hessian or some, you know, the generalized Gauss-Newton that we talked about, and approximating it with its own diagonal. Um, this notation here just means the diagonal of this matrix. And then you turn that into a diagonal by putting it onto a zero matrix. You, you get the idea. Um, so the storage cost of this is great, right? It's just O of n. It's just the number of parameters. All you have to do is store those diagonal entries. Um, and applying it uh, to, compute, you know, to compute the update via the inverse is also very cheap, right? Inverting the diagonal matrix just amounts to inverting each entry, which are scalars. So again, that's just O of n. Um, now, that's the storage and inversion cost. The computation cost for diagonal matrices can actually be a bit subtle. Uh, and it really depends on the form of the matrix that you're using. Um, so for certain, certain types of Bs, it's actually, um, this can be sort of non-trivial. And there are, actually computing it um, exactly can be hard. But there are unbiased estimation techniques. For example, my work on curvature propagation. Um, Certain special cases, you can do it efficiently. Other cases, you sort of have to resort to a technique like this or other techniques of a similar flavor. Um, but it's more or less well understood how to do this for the typical cases. Um, I'm actually working on a code base right now, which, among other things, allows this to be done efficiently for the generalized Gauss student and um, other such matrices. Uh, it's the empirical fissure where this is very, very easy. And this is, in some sense, why the empirical fissure appears so often. Um, so, the, um, so, so this approximation will be uh, reasonably accurate if the eigenvectors of B are closely aligned with the coordinate axes. Um, so if your matrix, in some sense, is, which, is that, which is to say that your matrix is already sort of close to diagonal. So just approximating it with its own diagonal, it won't be so um, egregious. Um, and if, if B is, in fact, this empirical fissure, which is just defined as the sums of the outer products of the gradients, then it's actually very easy to compute this diagonal. You don't have to use fancy methods like curvature prop. And um, essentially, it just amounts, because this, if this is the sum of outer products, then the diagonal of this matrix is just the sum of the entry-wise products. So, all your, so as long as you're computing gradients already, you can kind of do this. There are some subtleties, but it's to do with summing over batches, but it's more or less well understood. Uh, and this leads to sort of several actual, actual quite popular um, methods that are used all the time in neural nets right now, um, RMS prop and Atom, which are um, built into a lot of libraries. Although it's not clear how much these actually help in practice. So this is sort of a sticking point with me, but. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, if this H I defines the ith entry of the um, gradient. No, oh, so no, it's not the ith entry. It's the, um, yeah, I should have been clearer. It's, um, it's like the ith training case. So, so it's, it's, it's the ith in the same sense as like it was in this, in, in this slide. Yeah, it's like, you know, the, yeah, exactly. Um, right. So, so that's diagonal methods. Um, Another type of approximation, which uh, was sort of more popular classically in the old optimization literature, are low rank approximations. Um, so the idea here is that we approximate our curvature matrix B 
um, as as a as a diagonal plus rank R matrix. Uh, so in particular, that it has a form like this: sum of um, lowercase r outer products of these vectors, plus some diag uh, uh, the uh, the diagonal matrix formed from some vector. Um, so this is relatively easy to store. It's um, just r times n. Relatively easy to apply the inverse. Um, and there are standard methods for, for actually computing this as an approximation to a particular B, although that B is almost always the Hessian or some kind of weird PSD approximation of the Hessian. You get into the methods like LBFGS BF, you know, and, and its predecessor BFGS, and these are sort of a, they're approximating the Hessian, but, but in fact, they're always positive definite, so it's sort of a weird approximation. Um, but there's a whole classical literature on this topic I won't go into. Um, and uh, this will be much less effective than using the real curvature matrix B if, um, if you have many different um, eigenvectors uh, with large eigenvalues. Whereas if you have a matrix that has like, only a few large eigenvalues, uh, then you know, an approximation like this might actually capture that quite well. Because basically, just these terms capture those, eigen, those few big ones. Uh, and then this just sort of cleans up. This provides you a, a sort of a, a lower bound on the rest. Um, but if you have sort of a kind of a very gradual slope, or you have an, you know a lot of eigenvalues distributed, you know, across a sort of a, a fat tail um, distribution, then this probably won't work. And it seems like neural nets fall into that category that they have this very long tail distribution of eigenvalues in their curvature matrix, which is sort of the the, the bad case. Um, <laughs> For all sorts of reasons, it's it's bad because it actually makes all the bounds for other optimizers worse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it, it's bad because it makes this this LBFGS approximation uh, potentially quite bad. Um, so this is not typically used in practice, but it's, it's still a uh, very important method historically and um, still an active research topic. Um, then we can get into block diagonal approximations. So this is where we take uh, B to be um, some block diagonal matrix, which might just be the blocks of the real B. Um, and uh, so for neural nets, you know, you, these blocks could have some kind of semantic meaning. They could be, for example, each block would correspond to the parameters uh, for the, that, that, that are the weights of the connections um, going into a specific unit, or the weights on the connections going out of a specific unit or all the weights in a particular layer. So there's different ways we could arrange things. Uh, partition, essentially, the, the parameters. Um, so the storage cost here is going to be just O of B times N, where B is the number of blocks. Um, and uh, the, the cost of uh, applying this inverse, which is essentially amounts to inverting each block, because the inverse of a, a block diagonal matrix is just a block diagonal matrix consisting of the, those different blocks inverted, so you just invert each block, um, is, is this. And um, the difficulty in actually computing this, is you could argue, is quite similar to computing the diagonal. Uh, and the similar kinds of methods apply. Um, again, I'm working on a code base that you know, does these things. It's computing certain block diagonal approximations. And all of that code is, in some sense, overlaps heavily with uh, the diagonal approximations as well. Um, turns, out, turns out that you really, from the standpoint of computing matrices, you don't actually get, it doesn't, the problem doesn't get much easier if you're only computing the diagonal. Um, that's a, you can actually prove that. Um, and uh, so now, of course, this, this idea can only really work if the block size is relatively small. Because now you're, you're solving these, you know, you're, you're computing these inverses on B by B matrices, so that's B cubed, and you're doing this many times, potentially. Um, so it, that can get quite expensive, unless B is quite small. Of course, if B is 1, then this reduces to a diagonal method again, um, which is then quite cheap. So a, um, a well-known example, pretty much the only you know, classical example of this is, is the so-called Tonga method from some decades ago, although it's not used anymore. Um, another thing you could do, and this is my research, is you could um, use Kronecker products 
approximation. So the idea here is that we're going to start with a block diagonal approximation of the GGN or, or, or Fisher matrix, uh, where these blocks are now going to correspond to entire layers, um, which, which, are, which are big blocks. These, you know, uh, the number of parameters in a layer can still be on the order of millions. So you know, we can't actually invert um, those kinds of blocks directly. But if we do an additional approximation, uh, then we can, we can maybe get there. And the additional approximation that's used in this, in this Kronecker product idea is that we're going to take each, each of these blocks to be uh, actually written as a Kronecker product between two smaller matrices. And the Kronecker product is defined like this. You just take C and you sort of tile it over a, mu a much bigger matrix, multiplying it by the corresponding entry of A. Uh, it seems like a weird kind of thing to do, but actually it turns out this is a, an algebraically very, very natural thing to do, and it has all sorts of really cool properties. Um, you can now, of course, you, you could ask, well, okay, but how am I actually going to take this giant block matrix and or this, this giant block and decompose it into a Kronecker product if I don't even have the block to begin with. I can't even compute it because it's too big. It's like a million times a million. So there's actually a direct formula uh, that you can use that actually tells you how to map certain quantities that you compute inside of the network, such as the activations or the backpropagated errors. And you can derive formulas for these blocks, or sort of these little factors of the block directly without actually computing the whole block. Uh, and this is, you know, again, detailed in, this, in these papers of mine. Um, so the storage and computational cost of this is um, just O of n, roughly speaking. It's the number of parameters. So that's, that's again, that's about as good as you can do. Uh, applying the inverse is, is, is like this, where b is the block size. So we've, we've saved considerably on that. Um, just recalling the, uh, you know, naively, it's, it's going to be, this is going to be the cost uh, for, blo for blocks of size b. But with this additional Kronecker factor approximation, you get it down to this. Um, and this is using the sort of remarkable fact that if you want to invert one of these Kronecker product matrices, it's just the same thing as inverting each factor and then taking the Kronecker product of that. Uh, and, this, and this gives state-of-the-art results for neural nets. Um, so the, uh, now I'm going to get into the last topic, uh, which is stochastic optimization. So a lot of what I've talked about so far when I mention empirical results, I'm always, you should always sort of interpret that as saying, well, it's these classical methods for sort of deterministic optimization applied with um, some stochasticity. So there, in, in practice, all optimization for neural nets is stochastic. Um, but I think it's still very instructive to think about the deterministic case, because that informs the this, this stochastic case uh, quite a bit. In fact, a lot of what you do uh, in, 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 in optimization research is that you just start with a deterministic te technique, and then you just kind of estimate the various quantities that you need using decayed averages, using mini batches, using various techniques. This all introduces all sorts of noise into the system, but no, the methods still more or less work, although they do break down in interesting ways too. Um, so just so uh, so the actual uh, so what I mean by stochastic optimization is is just that the you know assuming that your objective function is written again like like as a sum of little losses over different training cases um, you know you have that your gradient is now of course the sum of gradients across the training cases and if m is very big this is very expensive so we're going to just um, you know. We're going we're gonna to use an approximation here, which is you know, basically taking advantage of the fact that these different h's aren't totally independent and uninformative of each other. They're actually sort of you know, getting good at one cat classification example sort of lets you get better at the other one, too, you know, at least up to a certain point. Once you start to really care about fine details, you know, the different whisker lengths, you know, then you might have to, then the different cases might sort of become independently informative. But at the beginning of optimization, it's almost always true that, that there's a lot of redundancy in the data. You don't need to really see all of the data to make, you know, to understand what the objective function looks like. Um, and, and so stochastic optimization is basically taking advantage of this idea. And the idea is, okay, instead of, 
computing this whole gradient over the whole training set, we're just going to subsample some random subset of the cases in the training set and uh, of size b. And b is an unfortunate letter here because this is, it's not the same b from before. Um, it just means batch size. So you can think of it that way. And, um, and now our approximate gradient is just this sort of this average over the smaller subset. And this is an unbiased estimator of the true gradient in the sense that the expectation of this quantity is the true gradient. Uh, so you can think of it as essentially just the true gradient plus this corrupting influence of this sampling procedure. Um, so in stochastic gradient descent, it's just sort of the obvious, as I, as I alluded to before, it's sort of the, you do the obvious thing. You just take the deterministic method, gradient descent, and you replace the exact gradient with the one that we've approximated using the mini batch. And you just get an update like this. And um, this does, you know, doing these kinds of approximations will affect um, convergence theory and also, also practical convergence too. Once you introduce noise, you have to start to do things, both in theory and practice, to, to get convergence. Um, and there are different strategies for this. So one classical strategy, which I would say is sort of fallen out of favor, uh, is to use a decaying step size, although it's still used in some examples. Um, so that the idea here is that um, if, if your step sizes, the, 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 these alphas, if the sum of the squares of them is finite, but the sum of you know, just the regular one is, is infinite, um, and for example, this is achieved by this choice here, 1 over k, um, because this is a harmonic series and this converges, uh, then you get you can prove convergence, and I would say there there is an intuition here for the for these uh, relationships. Basically, this one is saying the amount of distance I'm allowed to travel is is never bounded. So, like if I am very far away from my minimum, my learning rates will always the sum of them into the future will always be big enough to get me anywhere. But the sum of the squares of them will be finite, which means in some sense that I'm eventually controlling the variance. Because you can imagine that the variance um, of the estimate of the gradient is, uh, is amplified by the, um, the learning rate that you multiply it, right? Because if you take a random variable, you multiply it by a constant, its variance gets bigger by precisely the square of that constant. Um, so, so this is in some sense saying that the some of the future variance is, gets under control. Um, and, and that's actually how they prove it, essentially. Um, so that's one strategy. It doesn't work that great in practice, especially if you are very strict about following a, a prescription like this, because uh, it, 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 it tends to make the learning rate go down too quickly, too fast. And ultimately, we don't actually care about stochastic convergence that, that much, so it's not super important that we actually converge. Um, Another technique which seems to work much better in my, in my experience is polyac averaging. The idea there is that you just average over the history of iterates, and that's actually, and then you treat this average as your sort of real solution. Um, and this essentially sort of blurs out the noise that you get um, during stochastic optimization, where your iterate is potentially jumping around a lot because of this, because of these stochastic gradients that you're using. Um, it seems kind of stupid, and this formula is kind of stupid, um, because you're averaging, say, for example, with your initial theta, and your initial theta is like way off in you know, nowheresville. It's like whatever you happen to start with, which is probably terrible. Um, but of course, over time, the effect of that initial theta gets smaller and smaller, because you're dividing by a larger and larger number here. Um, still, though, this is still bad, and nobody actually uses this formula, even though this is what you need to prove the, the, the theory. In practice, what you do is, is typically do a decayed exponential average like this, um, which is much better at forgetting the past in some sense. Um, there's also methods that reduce uh, the variance of the gradient, of the stochastic gradient, using special um, variance reduction techniques. Oops. Uh, these are SVRG and SAG. Um, they haven't really taken a hold in, in deep learning yet. I think, again, partly because we don't actually care about getting very, very fine convergence. This is going back to the previous point about how um, 
uh, we, in, in you know, optimization, we're not really, in practical optimization, you essentially just want to continue optimizing until your method starts to, your, your model starts to overfit. And so you don't so much care about getting this sort of a asymptotic convergence performance as you sort of zero in on the exact solution that almost never comes up. Um, so second order methods, um, you know, you might also want to apply the same, the same ideas there uh, and have a stochastic second order method or a stochastic momentum method too. Um, so but there's, there, you know, there's some problems here. The, uh, the second order methods, you need to compute this matrix B, of course, or some estimate of this matrix B, um, some approximation of it. And, you know, computing B just on the current mini batch turns out to be not good enough. Um, the, the reasons for this are sort of subtle, but it's, it was sort of a, the bane of my existence for a couple of years doing research on this topic. Um, essentially, if you, if, you, if you don't, if you include a very small amount of data when you compute B, in some sense your B becomes very low rank, it has no curvature in a lot of directions, and it is very, very optimistic about where you can go, and it sort of doesn't model what will happen to other training case losses that are not in that mini batch, and then you and the things just go very badly from there. Um, and so, a solution that is basically always used in practice is then to sort of maintain some estimate of B that is a decayed average of these Bs computed on mini batches over time. So we sort of we use. So at each step, you know, you're, you 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 have your your B computed just on the mini batch. And now I'm kind of saving that and mixing that into this, this bigger and bigger average of, of past Bs. And of course, those past Bs are for other parameters in old settings of the parameters. And so they're sort of, they become increasingly obsolete as time goes on. You're sort of mixing in this kind of garbage information into your signal. Uh, but the idea, again, with, with decayed averages is that that information sort of decays exponentially. Um, so. It, 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 this is an effective strategy, and this is used pretty much every stochastic second order method uses this idea. Um, right, this is this the staleness is the problem I'm talking about. Uh, so momentum uh, is also another method you, you might want to apply in the stochastic setting, and it, and, and, and it certainly does actually quite well uh, and helps in practice. Um, you do have to be more careful about the learning rate and the decay uh, when you're in the stochastic setting, and um, also, a common practice is to sort of turn the, the, the momentum down or even off as you get very close to the minimum. Again, though, we don't typically get very close to the minimum in neural nets, so not such a big issue. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of theorists really, really hate you know, SGD and momentum. They'll, they'll say, oh, it actually doesn't help at all, or it helps for sort of silly reasons. I would take that with a grain of salt. It actually does help a lot, and people use it all the time, and there's pretty good theories about why it helps. Um, the basic intuition, though, is just that stochastic optimization resembles deterministic optimization for a large early period of optimization, especially if your mini batches are big enough. Um, so you can just sort of think about it as whatever the, the deterministic case does, plus the sort of corrupting influence, which gets worse and worse as time goes on. Um, so, so this is, in fact, this is the formalization of that intuition then. It's, um, if you think of the stochastic gradient, it's just the regular gradient plus this corrupting influence epsilon. And you could even model this, uh, you could model this, say, as a, um, a Gaussian. Although in practice, it's not a Gaussian. But you can, in the limit of large numbers, it sort of becomes Gaussian. Um, and of course, you would note that the, the expectation of this is just the, it's just the gradient, as long as this has mean 0, which it would. Um, you can actually, if, if you think about it this way, and then you think about what happens to a, um, um, if, you, if you look at, say, a, a strongly convex quadratic, so this is just a quadratic that has positive curvature, and you apply SGD, or you apply a um, kind of a basic stochastic second order method, uh, then the expected value of your current iterate actually uh, behaves the same as the iterate would in the non stochastic algorithm. So you're sort of, you're, you're base, you're, your algorithm is basically sort of performing exactly like the, the deterministic version does, plus some 
ball of uncertainty around that spot. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is actually true. This is not just an intuition. This is actually true for quadratic problems. Uh, for non-quadratic problems, then it becomes a kind of a, a useful heuristic way of thinking about the situation, I would say. Um, so what does the th theory say exactly? Um, so one, uh, I would say, you know, very important thing to understand, first of all, is that the theory says that there is no asymptotic advantage to using second order methods or momentum methods over plain stochastic gradient descent with this polyac averaging. Remember, polyac averaging was, uh, is this technique here, averaging the iterates across past iterations. So there's no asymptotic advantage. That is to say that the bounds asymptotically don't get better. Um, and there's actually matching lower bounds to show that that's the best you can do in the worst case. Um, OK, so that would seem to say that, well, maybe th these methods aren't great. But again, um, it's, you know, asymptotics are, are not what they're cracked up to be. Um, so just to be a little bit more specific, um, SGD with this polyac averaging is asymptotically optimal. Not only is it just as good as these methods, it's as good as any method ever could be among any technique that tries to perform statistical estimation of parameters using any method, gradient descent, oracle methods that just get to do anything they want, use unlimited computation. Um, it, is, it is asymptotically optimal in that sense, in the sense that as you see data, um, this is as good as you can possibly do. There's a, an intrinsic uncertainty in what the actual parameters are until you've seen enough data. And SGD with polyac averaging is asymptotically doing as good as you possibly can do in that respect. It is using the data in a maximally efficient way. Um, but pre-asymptotically, that's where the advantage of second order methods and momentum can still come in in the stochastic case. Um, and that's actually what we care about in practice. We care about what happens before this asymptotic theory kicks in. And you can show that a bound like this, if you actually expand out this, this, big, of o, this big O, which is actually hiding these higher order terms here, those higher order terms, while they don't matter in the limit as k goes to infinity, um, they do matter pre-asymptotically, and they're different for SGD with polyac averaging versus a second order method or a momentum method. So those terms get better, uh, which means that even the theory says that you will, that there is some advantage. It's just you won't see it as k goes to infinity. But k never goes to infinity in practice, so we're we're sort of we're still okay, and momentum is very widely used. Second order methods a bit less so because they're more complicated and expensive, but they're also used, um, especially diagonal methods. Diagonal second order methods are actually used quite a bit. Um, so this is again one of these situations where I would say the theory, if you take it literally, if you take the this asymptotically optimal phrase and you sort of run with it too far, you'll you run into trouble, um, which is why it's always important to do experiments. And um, I think that's the end of the lecture now. These are uh, some useful texts that I've um, read over the years. In particular, this is sort of the classical view of optimization um, from Nosedal and Wright, um, looking at research mostly from the 60s and 70s, algorithm building, a lot of intuition. And then there's sort of the flip side of that, which is the pure theory, you know, best represented by uh, Yuri Nesterov, the inventor of the Nesterov method, among other things. And I think you know, reading both of these sort of gives you a very good sort of complementary view of the two basic perspectives on optimization. Um, these guys don't care so much about asymptotic performance. They're very much interested in sort of practical performance and Nesterov the other way around, although the, both of them have useful insights. Um, and uh, yeah, and there's some, this is a paper that I think talks, does a good job at explaining um, the importance of momentum in deep learning, especially and in also initialization too. This is sort of an early paper showing that, sort of exploring the importance of doing good optimization for uh, neural nets. Um, this is a, pap uh, a paper of mine recently posted in archive, well actually not that recently anymore, uh, looking at natural gradient <laughs> methods and their sort of connections to second order methods and a lot of the talk, stuff I've talked about in this lecture sort of explained in much more detail in that, uh, in that paper.
And that's the end. Uh, and I'll take any questions if you got them. Or if you want to come up after, after everybody starts to pack up, you know, I'll be here for on the next uh, 10 minutes or something. All right.